Hi everyone, Zach here, and welcome to lesson 32 in this series on developing a survival game. In this video, we will start setting up our tessellation for our water material. We will be doing this so that in the next video, we can add in multiple ways to give our water a more realistic feel. This series and this video have been brought to you by my Patreon sponsors, and with that said, fire up your project, and let's make a start. Hi everyone, and welcome back to the editor. This will be a much shorter video than the last time we were here, setting up our water. And in today's video, we're gonna set up part of our tessellation. In fact, we're just gonna do our tessellation multiplier. And the reason we're only doing part of our tessellation today is that the other part of our tessellation will be our Geisner wave calculations. And that's gonna take a bit of work to do. So I'd rather split them into two parts to make it a bit clearer on what we're doing and a bit easier to follow. So go ahead and let's go to our materials for a second. Let's go to our water and let's open up our M water. And let's go to our main node here and scroll down until we find tessellation. Under tessellation, like I said in the last video, we're gonna switch over to PN, sorry, uh, flat tessellation. And we are going to allow for adaptive tessellation, but we will not use crack free and we will do a max displacement of 20. All right, now let's go ahead and compile this just for a moment. Just for a moment, let's compile this and then we're gonna take a look at something. So let's go over to our main window here, let the shaders finish recompiling. I always like how weird that looks. All right, what I want you to do is go over to wireframe and I'm going to just start minimizing stuff for a moment. And I'm gonna look for the sky sphere and I'm gonna hide that. So. It's kind of hard to see the plane, but you can see the quads right there. It's not doing much. The reason why it's hard to see is due to how the normals are set up and the translucency, um, but you can kind of see it. Now we're gonna watch when we change how that's going to update. But we'll, we'll take care of that down the road. Go up back to materials, add a new folder. We're gonna call this folder global functions. And there's really gonna be two in here. We might actually have three in here. The first we're gonna have, let's just open this up, is a material function. So I'll go to materials, right click, go to materials, material function, and get used to me making this joke. Uh, MF for material function, camera distance tessellation is what we're gonna call this. I didn't make my joke at least. And we're gonna plug that into there, or pin that into there. And we're gonna do in here, just write a calculation, so a Material function is a function that can be called up in materials related to materials. And I'm just gonna rename this output instead of result, it'll be our tessellation multiplier. So I know what it is. In fact, I'll be nice to myself and put a space in. Also, I think there's too many L's in tessellation suddenly. I normally have one too few. All right. And so what we're gonna do with our tessellation multiplier is we aren't just gonna multiply a flat number in. I mean, we could, sorry, we could. We could just you know put a scalar value in, plug that into our multiplier and set this to some absurd number like 200. Um, and hey, we're multiplying by 200 every single time. And that is not what we're gonna do That We're gonna be a bit smarter about this. So what we're gonna do is based on where our camera is positioned, we're gonna lerp between two tessellation multipliers. So that's the end of the equation. Let's just do that really quickly since we already know it's gonna be. It's gonna be a lerp, so a linear interpolate between two values. Now, how do we know what's near and far? So again, we're, we're basing this on how close between two values and we're basing this two values on how close the camera is to that object. So that's gonna be our alpha, how close to the object are we? So how do we know what near and far is for A and B? Well, we know that A is zero, B is one, and our alpha is halfway between those two. So if you think about it as distance, zero units away, one unit away. So A is near, B is far. So we're gonna create a new input function. 
Now this is the wrong sort of input function, but what an input function is, is a function that we, or a variable that we can declare outside of this function. So it's an input into this function. So when we have a um, normal function, we put the input arguments in, that's what this is. We need to change this from a type three to a scalar. And this will be called near tessellation. We're just gonna plug that into there. And now you can only use these nodes once. So if you have to use it multiple times, place it in a spot where you don't have to worry about too much spaghetti. We're gonna create another input function. And again, change it to a scalar type. And this will be a far tessellation. And we'll just plug that into our B. So we have our near and our far done. Don't worry about what this looks like here. It's not gonna look like anything. Now let's worry about our alpha. So we have to lerp between our far and our near. Well, how are we gonna do that? We're gonna get the distance between the camera and the surface that we're looking at. So there's a node for that. Well, multiple nodes we need for that, but there's one to get our camera position. And we can get our camera position in world space. So we'll take that. And then we can, you know, do a absolute or world position, absolute world position. But instead of using that, we're actually gonna use it as an input just in case we want to do anything with that math inside of this um, function. If you don't want to do anything with it, then you don't need to do this step. You can just use the absolute world position. Instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do an input function. This is of type uh, vector three, and it will be our world position. And I'm going to subtract from our camera's location, the absolute world position of the object that's using this material function. And then I want to get the actual distance. So we have a vector length node, and this gives us that value, except for I want the uh, value on a vector three. So this is the distance between camera and surface. And this is the uh, multiplier multiplier value by location and location's alpha. And I'll put multiplier value A, B in there. So A and B are the multiplier value and by locations are alpha. Now we can't just plug straight into there. I mean, we could, but we, we want to have a bit more finer control over this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually subtract again and we're going to, on this subtraction, give ourselves another input value. So we'll do a function input of type scalar. And it will be our test for tessellation offset. So this is how much we're offsetting the tessellation by. So this allows us to move the tessellation. And we could skip this one. This one is optional. The next one, however, is important. And that we'll do a divide for. And this determines the actual fade distance between our near and our far. So what we're gonna do is do another input, so function input of type scalar. And we will declare this one or call this one our fade, that's what we call test fade distance. I strongly recommend calling these two test offset and test fade distance and not just offset and not just fade distance because we will have other parameters known as offset and fade distance used elsewhere in our materials in this section. Go ahead and plug that in. And so this is our control over offset. And this is the control over fade. So really it's what's controlling our alpha at the end of the day. Let me just move these a bit closer, line this all back up. It might be uh, materials, so, you know, and we might not be able to do things as neatly, but we try to be as neat as possible. And we're just gonna plug that into our alpha. So what we're doing here, if we were just to comment all of this out, is this is our tessellation multiplier based on camera location relative to surface. All right, now with that done, I'm going to apply, save, and go to my water material here. And in my water material, I am going to simply 
find a nice blank spot underneath our normal here. In fact, actually, I'm thinking about this. I want to move our normal because I know that we're going to have a lot more that goes underneath there. I'm going to tuck it right there, actually. And I'm going to bring this over this way. As I said, we're going to break this. And we'll be breaking that in the next video, I believe. I believe. I'm just going to double check that in a moment. Um, but scroll down to underneath our normals here. And we're going to actually put it right here for now. But we're going to put a lot of space between this later on. And we're going to do our function or material function call. Now, because I had already selected this function in our graph or our main editor here, it auto filled in. But let me just uh, go to a different thing and select our mannequin's body and do material function call. If you get something like this where nothing's there, go to the drop down and search for MF camera distance tessellation or whatever you named it and notice it fills in everything. All right, I am going to take my tessellation multiplier here and I am going to pull this up to my tessellation multiplier. It's gonna give me a bunch of errors, which is basically none of these are filled in. I haven't given default values. In fact, actually what I'm going to do real quick is come in here and give this a default value of one. And that's on the near tessellation. I do want that to default to one, just so I have that preset in case I ever decide to not overwrite it. Now to set this up fully, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create parameters off this. So I'm gonna right click, promote to parameter, and I was going to get rid of um, the, word, the letter S. So we have our fire tessellation, which, again, I'm going to default to 1. I'm not going to give it any value outside of that. I'm a little bit annoyed how these show up. That's going to be my near. And again, I'm going to leave that at 0. You can just go straight down the row. I'm doing it in the order in which I think about these things. My tessellation fade distance, I am going to promote to a parameter. I am going to default this to 0.5 for now. There we go. I really don't like the order in which these came up. I like near and far being near each other. My tessellation offset, again, I'm going to promote to a parameter. And I am not going to give it any value. I am going to leave this at 0. And then for our world position, I am going to get the absolute, or sorry, the world position, which will come up as absolute world position. I am going to leave it with the including material um, offsets. We will change that later on. And there we go. We now have our tessellation multiplier accounted for. So I'm just going to actually I should say this after I do this step. I'm going to highlight that and do tessellation multiplier. And there we go. We can see we're increasing the number of instructions. And because that is just so messy looking, we're going to put a reroute in bring this down here. Don't worry about cleaning this up just yet, mostly because we have some other things that we need to do, but I am going to tuck this over here just for a moment. Sorry, I misspoke earlier. I said we we're going to get rid of this. It's actually this one we're breaking. Um, that's why that reroute's there, because we're going to plug something else into this. Uh, sorry about that, but now we have some tessellation set up. So let's just apply, save everything, and we can close these two materials out. And we can go back to our map and take a look at what we have. Let me just finish saving this. All right, with it saved, close it out. Save our material uh, function as well. Just go back to our water, open up our instance. And just like before, I'm going to put this on the corner and get it to fit to the side of my screen like that. Pull this back in a bit. And I'm going to hit play. Just going to move the camera here because this is the position I like testing it from. And I'm going to exit out. I'm not going to move the camera again. And I'm just going to switch to wireframe for a moment. And you can see in the distance our, our quads or our vertices. All right. The next thing I am going to do is I am going to change some of these settings in our instance. So for our bar tessellation, I am going to leave it at 1. For our near tessellation, which I'm not sure why I didn't actually have the defaults backwards on that. The defaults should be, uh, it should be one and zero on near. One should be one, uh, near should be one and far should be zero. But you know what? I do want the far at, at one, so I'm going to leave that as is. So it's just multiplying by one. The near, however, 
I am going to increase. And I'm just going to show you what happens when we increase it. Notice that the water, if I go back down a bit, becomes just a little bit more smooth looking, a little bit more, well, not smooth, the, the ripples look a little bit more pronounced, just a little bit. Very subtle effect. And you can see that the there are more quads, on the lines are showing up more clearly. In fact, I'm just going to raise this to 25 for now. I'm going to go back to 1 for a moment. If you look in the distance, it might be really hard to see this. Let me actually move the camera despite what I just said a moment ago. You can see just very faint changes. It isn't much. In fact, actually, I'm not entirely sure I can see them anymore. But I know that they will play a role down the road when we get into actually putting in the offsets. I might not be able to see it due to the lack of offsets, but meh. All right, for our tessellation offset, I am going to leave it at zero. For our tessellation fade, well, let's see if we can notice a difference. Not really, so I'm going to just leave that at 0.5 for now. But that is the start for our tessellation. And in the next video, we are going to do our Geisner wave calculation to give this water a little bit more life and a little bit more meaning. And again, it's going to look a bit weird because it's meant for a big open water, not water in a confined area like this. So it will look a bit awkward. Also looks a bit awkward because the Kai Spears turned off. All of that said, the series has been brought to you by Patreon sponsors like Quad Menson, Haynes, One Volt Ten, Rian, Connor, and Galois. If you've enjoyed this series, make sure to hit the like button down below. If you've enjoyed working on your water and getting your tessellation multiplier set up, make sure to hit that like button. If you want to be here when we finish out making our water and putting in our Geisner wave calculations, then make sure to hit the subscribe and notify icon. That said, I look forward to seeing you in the next tutorial, and I hope that you have a wonderful day.